Hey YouTube, it's Weird Paul. I'm celebrating 30 years since I released my fourth album. It was on October 28, 1989. So let's take a look back at the making of Does Anyone Want This? In February of 1989, I released my third album, Now I Blow My ABCs. Having just completed tech school, I was still unemployed. So I had lots of time on my hands, but for six months between February and August, I barely wrote any songs. I had a bad case of writer's block, and the stuff I was writing just wasn't any good. <laughs> I did do a lot of things during those six months. I played a few shows, including opening for the punk band Decroitzen. I released the first catalog for my record label. I filmed a whole bunch of Weird Paul music videos and released them on VHS tape. I released the live tape Live at the Underground, a tape of songs I wrote and recorded with my sister called Othello, and a tape called the Petrosky Compilation that featured songs by every member of my family. I also re-recorded my lost 1987 cassette, The World According to Petrosky, and I compiled Tommy's Are Cute, a tape of me and my sister playing with her Tommy dolls back in the late 70s and early 80s. In May, I went back to work at my old job at Tri-State Finishing, where I would remain employed for the next 18 years until they closed in 2007. Aside from going to my job, I really wasn't going anywhere or seeing anyone. I'd lost touch with most of my high school friends as they went away to college. And though I didn't really understand it at the time, I was suffering from social anxiety. My family really wasn't making videos together anymore. My sisters were getting older, and they were finding new interests and having a social life. I became lonely, and the loneliness began to spiral into depression. So I don't know. I get, I'm so messed up in the head, you know, so... I just, like can't take it. The only thing that could help was for me to get back to writing songs. And luckily, I found some new music that inspired me and that I became obsessed with. Scrawl were a band that I was supposed to open for back in 1988 at what would have been my first real gig, but the show got cancelled. Between March and April 1989, I bought both of their albums, plus also two, and He's Drunk. Scrawl's songs were simple and emotional, noisy, but with great vocal harmony. I was in love with them and sang along to the albums as I played them over and over. The other musician that I discovered would become one of the most influential artists on my music from that day on. I first heard a Daniel Johnston song in February of 1989 on the college radio station WRCT. It was the song Big Business Monkey, and for a moment I thought one of my sister's songs was being played on the radio. In May, I went down to the record store and found a copy of his cassette, Don't Be Scared. Immediately upon listening to it, I found that some of what I was going through was starting to make more sense to me. Within a couple months, I'd ordered every Daniel Johnson cassette that was available, and the more I listened to them, the more inspired I was feeling. Daniel Johnson composed and performed some of his songs on the chord organ, an instrument that my family had owned since I was very young, and that I'd played on my 1987 album, In Case of Fire, Throw This In. I started learning to play Daniel's songs on it, which led to me composing my own songs on it. I also got another instrument that summer that would change my songs dramatically. On July 22nd, I went down to Hill's Department Store and bought an Ohio Art Silver Steel Kids drum set for $52.85. The heads were made of a thick paper, but it sounded decent. I thought the cymbal sounded weak, so I attached a pie pan to the bottom. It gave it more substance. My new favorite music impressed upon me that I needed to make my songs simpler and to put my own real emotions into the music and lyrics. I found that I actually had a lot to say, and by then, the songs were coming to me much easier and quickly. One of the first songs that I wrote for the album was Bank Robber, the opening track. I was listening to WRCT during their special annual Massive Music Weekend, where they played half-hour blocks of different bands. During the 30 minutes of the band Pear Ubu, I started jamming along to the song Ubu Dance Party, and that's how I came up with the guitar lead. It ended up sounding more like a Stooges song. Wow. 
That same morning, January 22nd, I started making a list of band names I'd thought up, and one was the Big Bank Suckers, and I decided that their song would be called Bank Robber. I recorded the song three days later. On July 24th of the year, it was during dinner time that night when my dad poured himself a nice cool glass of Tang. He found to his surprise that there was something floating in it, and that something turned out to be a small piece of steak. I headed upstairs, grabbed my acoustic guitar, and within minutes had written Piece of Meat in the Tang, which is still one of my more popular songs. The third song on the album, Garage Band, was one of the last songs that I wrote on September 22nd, around the time that I was recording most of the other songs. I came up with the riff, and I decided to get my dad on the album by having the lyrics be a conversation with him. Boys in the band are coming up. Boys. The boys in the band was something that my friend Ed used to say. He also used to say that I had a song called Being a Great Guy. This one's called, uh, Being a Great Guy. And he said, <coughs> I didn't have a song called that, but on June 10th, I started writing one. The lyric, excessive consumption may cause laxative effect, was something that I saw in this pack of Sorby sugar-free candy I bought at KB Toys for 50 cents. Let's just say that I excessively consumed them. The fifth song, Depression, was one of my first attempts at writing a song on the chord organ, not long after I'd bought all the Daniel Johnston cassettes. I wrote it on August 9th and 10th, and it was the first song where I tried to describe what I was going through. The next song, My Pants Got Dicked, was a song that I wrote while going to recording school in Chillicothe, Ohio in November of 1988. I was in a laundromat with my classmates, Tom and Steve. Steve was trying to dye his jeans in a washer, and they got ruined. Tom was from Delaware, and he said that in his neck of the woods, if you got royally screwed, the popular phrase to use was, I got dicked. In the mid-80s, my sister and I used to play DJ. Our rooms were on opposite sides of a wall with a hallway between. I'd run a speaker from my stereo through the hall and into her room. She also had a set of toy telephones similar to these, which we put between our rooms so the listener could call and request to whichever one of us was being the DJ. I recorded short commercials that we'd play between the songs, and one that I recorded with my mom in September of 1985 became the seventh song on the album. <laughs> for your girlfriend. Let My Sister Go to Kennywood was written on August 7th, 1988. Kennywood is an amusement park in Pittsburgh, PA. My sister's friend called and asked her to go to Kennywood with her. She started begging my parents to let her go. I got out my guitar and wrote the song, which succeeded in getting their permission. It was originally going to be on Now I Blow My ABCs, but it got replaced by the song Little White. One of the last songs that I recorded for the album was Quicksand Box on September 24th. I just bought the Happy Flowers CD, Too Many Bunnies, Not Enough Mittens, and it inspired me to try to do a song in their style. I had my brother randomly strum on an out-of-tune guitar while I banged away on my drum set. We put ourselves in the childhood nightmare situation of being in a sandbox full of quicksand with no one to pull us out. Oh my god, you're thinking! You're thinking in a sandbox in quicksand! <laughs> the tenth song, She's Wearing Black, is possibly the first love song that I ever wrote, or at least the most obvious one. Sometime in early January, as I was drifting off to sleep, the main lyrics of the song just came into my head, so I jumped out of bed and wrote them down. The next day, I wrote some of the music, and then finished it and recorded a demo a few weeks later. At the time, recording demos wasn't something I usually did. Black. 
The most popular song from this album now is the chord organ song, You Can Own Your Own Home Without Even Breaking My Heart. On August 15th, I was playing Daniel Johnson songs on the chord organ when my little brother came up to me and told me that he liked the Daniel Johnson song that was called, You Can Own Your Own Home Without Even Breaking My Heart. Of course, that wasn't a Daniel Johnston song, but I began writing it immediately. Most of the lyrics were all on different pages in my idea book. It took me a little while to put them all together into something that sounded good. The idea for the next song, Play Putty, came about on June 11th. Using a coupon from the back of a box of Fruit Loops, my little brother got a free package of Play Putty, a generic silly putty, down at Toys R Us. However, he immediately lost it when he threw it at my sister out in our yard when she was annoying him. I changed Fruit Loops to Apple Jacks because it fit better, and I used some music that I'd already written that past December. I lost my Play Putty. The thirteenth song on the album was the oldest. I'd written the Donkey Kong Blues back in early to mid-1982, and it actually was originally sung to the tune of Pac-Man Fever. Cause I got the Donkey Kong Blues, oh yeah, I got the Donkey Kong Blues, nah, 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 nah. I recorded it on July 29th, when my writer's block was starting to end, and I was seeing the value in all sorts of things that I'd done earlier in my life. On August 12th, I got together one more time with my friends Kurt and Chris before they went back to college. I brought my drum set over to Kurt's house, and we recorded about an hour of us just jamming. And one of the songs was about how I was afraid that Kurt was going to break my little drum set, because he was a really good drummer. The next song on the tape after that was You Better Be or You're Gonna Be, which I'd originally recorded on one of my unreleased tapes, 1986's In Case of Fire Throw This In. This was a brand new recording with me playing the drums. You better be or you're gonna be. The last song on side one of Does Anyone Want This was another version of Blackout, which I'd been doing on every album. The Black Flag version of Blackout used the drum beat from their song, Gimme Gimme Gimme. I flushed the toilet with my foot with something that I was told a drunk guy was yelling out when Henry Rollins played in Pittsburgh the first time in 1987. I flushed the toilet with my foot! At the end of side one, I recorded an unlisted bonus track called Our Garage Sales Great. It was about a dozen of these couplets that I'd written about what my mom was selling at the local flea market. Our garage sales great, we still haven't sold the drapes but I'll vouch for the fact that we sold stupid wooden shapes. Side two of the album starts off with the High School Cookers Club theme, which I wrote and recorded on March 1st, 1989, after hearing my brother yell, It's the High School Cookers Club! at our dinner table. This was the second song that I'd recorded that featured the toy instrument Merlin the Electronic Wizard. High School Cookers, the chosen one! About two months later, on May 6th, I was at a rummage sale, and I found and bought a copy of the KISS album, Alive 2. And inside of the album cover was some stationery from the desk of Ellen McDonald. And on the other side of the paper was a poem, presumably written by Ellen, about how much she loved KISS, and how she knew that someday, somehow, she would meet them. That very day I wrote music to go with the poem, and I called the song, Ode to a Band. My dream is This was the first song that I played my new drum set on, and I mic'd the drum set with this realistic stereo electret microphone, pointing its two twin mics across the top of the kit. I would continue using this to mic the drums for the next couple years. A Spasm of Emotion was one of the first songs that I ever wrote on the chord organ around August 9th. At first, it didn't have a title, and I didn't use any of these possible titles, though Will I See Her was a contender for a while. A Spasm of Emotion was something I'd written in my idea book. When I was in grade school, we watched a film strip that was some kind of visualization of William Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream. 
I remember thinking that some of the masks that they wore made their heads look like apples. That inspired me later in fifth grade to type a few sentences on a piece of paper. Not only did I not know what the word meant, I didn't even know how to spell it. Over four years later, during the first week of July 1985, I heard a new song by the band Dire Straits, and they said that word in the song a couple times. That inspired me to get that piece of paper back out, and I finished writing it on July 9th, 1985. It was just a long string of insults, including some really 80s ones, like, You bought the Colgate pump, and You ate the last Oreo cookies and cream sandwich. And at the end, it all turned around. You're a flounder face, but I love you. Song number 21 was Soda Jerk, which I first had the idea for in June. I finished writing it in July, and by then I decided that I'm going to finish songs no matter what, even if I have to borrow music or lyrics from other songs that already exist. In this case, I borrowed the lyric, Gonna Cruise the Miracle Mile, from Billy Joel's It's Still Rock and Roll to Me. I used to hold the play button down on my boombox, but not press it down all the way, and it would play songs much faster than they were supposed to be. I found out that my song Bolt Cut from my 1987 album In Case of Fire Throw This In actually sounded pretty good that way, back when I recorded the song The Wrong Speed on my 1987 unreleased album The World According to Petrosky. It was shorter that way too, only 23 seconds, so I just changed an earlier unused title from my idea book from 39 second masterpiece to 23 second masterpiece. Back in November of 1988, my classmates Steve and Tom were really into the new U2 album Rattle and Hum. We'd sit in the trailer and play the song Desire over and over again. On July 21st, 1989, I asked myself the question, what if Sonny Bono, of Sonny and Cher fame, gave mononucleosis to Bono of U2? Well, I guess that would be Bono Bono Mono. I just stole the music from U2's song, Desire. I figured that was appropriate since it was about Bono. And if Sonny Bono gave Bono Bono, it'd be Bono Bono Bono. In the lyrics, I gave a shout out to John Beers, the real name of the Happy Flowers member, Mr. Horribly Charred Infant. But as far as borrowing other people's music or lyrics, Bun and Mouth Blues had the most. Even the title was based on the Henry Rollins song, Gun and Mouth Blues. When I first started writing the words, I was having trouble. So I just borrowed some from Scrawl, the Ramones, the Human Beings, and even a whole bunch from Bob Dylan. On April 8th, Ed Agogo and I had gone to the University of California, Pennsylvania to play a concert at the Underground, which was the basement of a house where a guy named Dave Sasson was living. Dave told me that he'd written a song about how hot dogs came 10 to a package, but buns only came 8 to a package, and he wanted me to record it. About two months later, on June 7th, he called me and told me what chords to play, and I wrote down all the lyrics, and it was the last song I actually recorded for the album on October 2nd. What's this world coming to? I just don't know what to do. My dad and I worked at the same place, so he'd drive me to work in the mornings. We'd drive down the street where we used to live back in the 70s. One morning, August 11th to be exact, we saw a sign on a pole that said, Corn in two weeks. It also said that they were going to have hot and sweet peppers. During work that day, I started singing Corn in two weeks to the tune of the Buzzcock song, Orgasm Addict. I got home and wrote the rest of the words, making them fit to that song. The 27th song on the album, Stop Spitting in the Rug, was inspired by my neighbors, Jan and Gary. They had moved next door in 1983. I remember the first time that my parents invited them over. They said they'd just gone to the theater to see the movie Gorky Park. Six years later, Jan was pregnant, and Gary said that her mood had really changed. When she'd get mad about something, she'd spit into their living room rug. That was all I needed to hear. Time to write a song. They'd separated by the following year. The next track on the album, Please Leave Me Alone, was a song that I wrote with Steve back in recording school the previous year. I originally called the song Leave Me Alone, 
but I added the word please when Michael Jackson came out with a song with the same title. I've been playing shows in 1989 at a venue called the Sonic Temple, and they were closing in August. I got asked to play at the final show that would be held there on August 31st. But I didn't have a drummer anymore. My friend Ed had just left for art school in New York. When I got to the Sonic Temple that night, I told the promoter, Manny Thiner, that I was just going to be playing solo. He volunteered to just get up on stage with me and play one of the other band's drum sets. He didn't even know a lot of the songs I was doing, but we didn't care. I decided to cover the old country song, Rocky Top, because I really liked the version by Scrawl. I only played about 30 seconds of it, and then Manny and I just started making noise. I decided to make it track number 29 and call it Rocky Top Manic Depressive Version. On May 13th, I had written a song called My Poop is Green, and it was inspired by exactly that. On the song, I played an electronic instrument that I'd recently found at a rummage sale, the Magical Musical Thing. It's green. About a month before I wrote that, when my writer's block was at its worst, I'd written some lyrics and music, but just like everything else, they weren't very good. As my album started really coming together, I wrote totally new lyrics for that music, and these ones reflected what I'd be feeling, the social anxiety that I didn't understand. That's probably why I called the song Wallowing in Self-Pity. The final song was one that I'd written five years earlier in 1984, just after the death of Marvin Gaye. I went to the bathroom I recorded most of the album during the two weeks between September 11th and the 24th, with the final two tracks done on October 1st and 2nd. In my journal on September 19th, I wrote that I was excited about my new tape. I'd worked from a list of all the songs I had written most or all of, and after timing out the lengths, I figured out what would fit on each side of the tape. By mid-August, I had decided to call the album Does Anyone Want This? The title and cover were inspired by a boiling bag meat product that my parents would often make for dinner in the 80s, made by a company called Freezer Queen. I'm holding that Salisbury steak up on my fork, wondering if anyone would want it, or if anyone would want my new album. I released the album on October 28, 1989, to coincide with a performance that I did at my high school friend Jason's birthday party in his parents' garage, where we'd done a bunch of weird Paul concerts in early 1988. Now that I didn't have a way to promote my tape to anyone or have any real gigs, I barely sold any. In two weeks, I'd only sold four copies. It was sold in the K Records catalog, where they advertised it by saying that I probably wasn't planning on becoming a productive member of society. On October 22nd, I mailed in my $10 to the U.S. Copyright Office, and about six weeks later, I got my official copyright for Does Anyone Want This? I realized that I needed to find more people to hear my album, so I spent $2 to take out an ad in Maximum Rock and Roll magazine. My ad appeared in the January 1990 issue, and I actually did get a few orders from strangers who'd never heard of me. But getting people's attention wasn't going to be easy for someone who barely left their house or talked to anyone, and seemed to be becoming more withdrawn all the time. I hope you enjoyed the look back at the making of Does Anyone Want This for its 30th anniversary. And if you did, don't forget to click on the like button down below. I'll see you soon with more memories. Thanks, YouTube.